Ever since uh, Acacia Bible School, Pastor Jay from Christ the Servant Evangelical Lutheran Church, just over the bridge, you know, over the, the, the train tracks, and I have been talking. Um, Pastor Jay, if you did not know, married into the Southminster family. <laughs> He's married to Annie Williams, uh, whose parents are here. Annie grew up in our church, and she also is a Lutheran pastor. So we have this connection, this bond. And we did a joint vacation Bible school, as you heard, uh, was that last week? Last oh, long week. So we thought, okay, well, what else can we do? And Jay and I have talked, and we've thought, well, what about, what about a pulpit exchange? Hmm, interesting concept. So on a particular Sunday, I will go over to Christ the Servant, uh, ELCA congregation, and I'll do two services over there, and an adult Sunday school, and then Jay gets a vacation. <laughs> he comes here. He'll come here and he'll do uh, one service here, and then also lead an adult uh, education service uh, class here. And the adult class that we each will be teaching uh, that day will be, uh, I will be talking about what it means to be part of the Reformed and Presbyterian family to Lutherans, and he will be here talking about what it is to be a Lutheran, particularly from the ELCA um, and uh, to us as Presbyterians. And this is also kind of embodies what the vision was for when our two denominations, the Presbyterian Church USA and the ELCA, came together in full communion. We are in full communion, meaning that the only thing that separates us is our traditions. Everything else we're in full agreement on. We can swap pastors back and forth. We actually have in this presbytery, in our original uh, grouping of churches, Presbyterian churches, we have joint Lutheran and Presbyterian congregations. We are one church with two different quarters the way and traditions of doing things. So that's what Jay and I are looking at doing. However, we hit kind of a snack because in the Lutheran Church, the ELCA, um, they have communion, especially over Christ the Servant, they have communion every Sunday. <gasps> <laughs> and so when we were throwing out dates, I told Jay, okay, well, here's this day, but we don't have communion, and then here's this day, which we'll have communion. I think it was a World Communion Sunday. And Jay said, I don't know how to do a worship service without communion. Because it's so integral to what it means to be Christian and Lutheran. And this is a similar conversation that I've had in our communion talks with the Episcopalians. The Episcopalians who also now have communion every Sunday. Now, granted, the ELCA, the Lutherans and the Episcopalians, didn't always have communion every Sunday. They were kind of like Presbyterians, you know, feast days, once a month, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just recently that they, uh, within the last 25, 30, 40 years, <coughs> that they've been doing communion every Sunday. And so I told Jay, uh, I said, yeah, I know, I know that we don't do communion every Sunday. Uh, but we are better than other Presbyterian churches because we have communion at least once a month and, you know, not just once a month, every feast day, all of those holidays, you know, Christmas and Easter and Pentecost, we actually have more communion services than the average bear. I mean, the average Presbyterian. <laughs> Bears may have more communion than us, who knows? Um, and he looked, and Jay, Pastor Jay, kind of just looked at me, you know, he's, he's a tall guy, he just kind of looked at me, popped his head and said, but what would John Calvin say? <laughs> touché, touché. Because John Calvin, I was surprised that you knew who John Calvin was. <laughs> now, John Calvin, uh, the founder of our tradition, our Presbyterian reform tradition, was out a radical. During his time, 
the church, the, the Roman Catholic Church, didn't have communion every Sunday. It was kind of a rare thing to happen also. And when it happened, it was only the, the people were given bread only and not the cup. And Calvin, in digging in and reading about the church history and looking at the practices of the church, of the early church, of the apostles, and wherever they went, they, he said that whenever Christians came together, assembled together, be it privately or in the catacombs when they were persecuted, no matter when, whenever Christians came together, they sang, they prayed, they read scripture and taught scripture, and they celebrated Holy Communion. So in John Calvin's eyes, he thought that every Sunday, every Lord's Day, every Sunday, that day of the week, Today, like today, when Christians gather together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, there should be communion also celebrated. The communion of the faithful, the communion with Christ, with thanksgiving, in great gratitude. But as I said, Calvin was kind of a radical. So when he was in Geneva, and he proposed this to the elders of the church, to the elders of the city. They all said, what? You've got to be mad. We only have taken communion once a year. This is too radical every Sunday, John. I don't know. So, John Calvin, being the sly dog that he was, said, all right, since I am the senior pastor and minister of the church's of Switzerland and Geneva at this canton, I will figure out how we can have communion every Sunday. And so it was said that no matter where in Geneva, at least one church, one church was celebrating communion that Sunday. So if you were somebody like John Calvin that believed that whenever Christians came together, it was appropriate, in fact, efficacious, and necessary that we celebrate communion. You could go from one church to another in the city of Geneva and have communion every Sunday. That's how John Calvin talked about it. Now, we get to the next person in our tradition, John Knox. John Knox, which is the founder of the Reformer for the Church of Scotland, the mother church of the Presbyterian Church of USA. When John Calvin went and sat at the feet of John Calvin, John Knox sat at the feet of John Calvin. There's so many Johns. <laughs> he brought back to Scotland also this concept. We need to be celebrating communion every Sunday because that is the practice of the ancient church. That is the practice of the apostles. That is how we are called to be a community because we believe that the sacrament is efficacious. It is integral to the Lord's day. However, one of the things that the elders of the church had to do before admitting anybody to communion was to go and take the confession of the members of the church. Oh, elders out there, can you imagine going house to house before communion and listening to the confessions of the members of the church? How long would that take? <laughs> that would take a long time. In modern time, I mean, you know, it took maybe a couple weeks to make sure we got schedules aligned. But in Scotland, imagine Scotland, you're up there in the highlands. You're up there, and people are in these little farms way off. And so it took forever of uh, congregations of thousands for the elders of the church to go and listen to the confessions of the members. So the members could get their little token, it was like a little coin, and which they had to present before they were able to take communion, because that was proof that an elder had come and heard your confession. So it became the practice in the Church of Scotland that communion was celebrated quarterly, every three months, because that's how long it took for the elders of the church to go out and hear the confessions of the members of the church. So that is the practice that came over to the United States. That, well, this is what we do. Can't remember why. <laughs> but we have communion at least at quarterly. 
So, when it came time around the 1950s and the 60s and the 70s, as the Presbyterian Church participated in the ecumenical movement, we're actually talking to other Protestants, we're talking to Catholics, we're talking to Orthodox, we're all coming together saying, it is, truly, it is integral that we celebrate communion every Sunday. And we need to work, we need to work fervently, we need to pour everything we have into finding the ways to reconcile our various denominations. Because as Christ prayed, we hear in the book of John, in the Gospel of John, that before Christ went to the cross for us, his prayer, his prayer for us, his prayers for his disciples, his prayer for his apostles, is that we would all be one. That there would be no division among us. And is that not part of the gospel we practice when we come together at the Lord's table? Sometimes we forget what we believe. Sometimes we forget what is taught through our faithful practices. We forget the theology, the, what we believe about God as it pertains to this sacrament. I have heard over the years, especially when we are in dialogue trying to get towards a full communion with another denomination like the Lutherans, Episcopalians, Moravians, Reformed Church, that we are always talking about our practices at the table. And when we start talking about communion every Sunday, our book of order, the order of our church says it is appropriate and essential for us to practice communion every Sunday. So the question is, our brothers and sisters of other denominations are doing it. Why aren't we? There's nothing in our theology. There's nothing in our book of order. There is nothing in our confessions. In fact, our order and our confessions say we should be. Why aren't we? Which leads to another interesting question. If we do profess what this table represents and means, that when we gather at the Lord's table, by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are lifted up and in the presence of Christ, who is the host, and when we eat this bread and drink this cup, proclaiming the life, death, and resurrection of Christ until he comes again, and by the Holy Spirit, we are united with Christ, and with each other, and that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to be a body of reconciliation in this world, why aren't we doing it every Sunday? Why? Why do we not commune together every Sunday? Anybody have any ideas of why? Have been tradition. Yeah, we're, let's actually, like I said, when our ancestors came from Scotland and started the church here in the Americas, we, they had communion quarterly because they also carried on the practice of going and listening to the confessions of each and every one of the members and giving them a lovely little token, which he had to present at communion. Do we do that anymore? No, we have a prayer of confession and service now. We don't have tokens. It is a free and open table to anybody and everybody. There is no, anybody that wants to come to the table is welcome at the table. Everybody is welcome at the table. What are some other reasons why we would not celebrate communion every Sunday? Time crunch. Time crunch. Oh, that's, you know what? That's probably the biggest one. <laughs> we have one hour to worship God. One hour away. And somehow within that hour, we got to figure out how we can commune with God through the sacrament. And everybody gets out on time. 
for the Green Bay Packers, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Other reasons why we would not commune. We may take it for granted, not think of it as meaningful, and in the same way that the Lord's Prayer, I think, has sped up over the years, maybe we don't get as much thought as we I think that is a perfect reason that sometimes, and that's one of the reasons why I'm preaching on this today, because, not only because of the conversation with Jay, I think the Holy Spirit is at work, that it is, if we do this every Sunday, and it becomes rote, it's just like, you know, something that we do. I mean, I've gone to, to Catholic Mass with my mother, and watched people just zoom through the communion line, and taking communion, and then they're out the door in order to get to their car before everybody leaves for brunch. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's not what we want. We want to be spiritually illuminated by the sacrament, which means that it's, it's two parts to that. One is for the congregation to come to communion with their hearts open that this is not something that is done every Sunday. This is a moment in time, this specific moment, God is meeting me in this cup. So your heart has to be open to that spiritual mystery in receiving it. And if you do if you do that, and I do that, then every feast day, every time when we commune together, then it will be a new experience, and we will be listening and hearing something new that the Lord is saying to us, not only through the word preached, but also the word incarnate within the sacrament. The other part is, of course, the leadership of the church. <laughs> I have listened to some pastors that are at the table, and I thought, oh my gosh, you died. <laughs> this is the joyful feast of our Lord. He rose from the dead. <coughs> yes, yes, Judy, you're spot on. What is one other reason? Dale? Finding people to prepare the bread. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, yeah, oh my gosh, there's so much work to that's done to set up the communion table. We've got to have somebody like Don Elliott to bake the bread so that the pastor can have some really good bread. <laughs> and we also need people to set up and prepare the table to do this holy act, this holy preparation to do that. And then we also need people to serve. To serve <coughs> their brothers and sisters. It is a lot of but if Christ is here saying, my table is here, come, come feast with me, then perhaps it is like the feeding of the 5,000 in regard to workers and bread. Jesus says, come, let us feast, let us feast joyfully. How many people would be bringing bread to Christ so that we could how many of you would bring a loaf of bread to your Lord and Savior? How many of you would bring a bottle of wine and good will of you guys? <laughs> when you're invited to a party and it's a potluck, what do you do? You bring. Yeah, and that's what it means to be convenient. So even in the preparation, we are practicing our theology, our understanding of what it means to be a Christian that we are celebrating and we're bringing everything to the table. Not only the bread and the wine, but we're bringing our whole selves to something. Because Jesus is alive. Jesus is here. Jesus gives himself to us. He is the living bread. He is the living bread. And when we participate in this feast, Jesus continues to live in each and every one of us. So brothers and sisters, today is the day of the Lord. Today is the day that our Lord rose from the dead. Today is the day that Christ, the risen Christ, comes to the table. He's got his cup. He's got a loaf of bread. And he's saying, come, feast with me. Feast with me now. Feast with all of those that have come before you, the communion of saints. Feast with all of your brothers and sisters. 
Throughout the whole world, there are feasting at the table right now. Everybody is at the table. Come to the table. Come and celebrate and live forever in me. Come. And what do you all say?